Let's do some more examples of determining whether a molecule is aromatic or not. Let's start with this example. Try to determine whether this molecule is aromatic, anti-aromatic, and non-aromatic. And as usual, I hope that for each example you'll pause the video and try the problem on your own before you start the video, starting, uh, before you start the video playing again and go through our explanation. Let's count the pi electrons. There's two pi electrons in the pi bond. The two carbons at the top are both sp2 hybridized, so they each have one p orbital. But because they're carbocations, they don't have anything to put in their p orbitals. So here we have an empty p orbital, and here we have an empty p orbital. So there's only two pi electrons total. two pi electrons total. Well, that falls into our list for aromatic compounds. So this is aromatic. Some people might get this wrong because they forget that the number two counts as an aromatic number of pi electrons. Remember that the general rule is 4n plus 2. Well, people forget that if n is 0, this formula would give us the number 2. If n was 0, we would get 4 times 0, which is 0, plus 2, which is 2. So the first number in this list is not 6. The first number is 2. This compound should look a little unusual to you because it's a dication. A dication, meaning that it has two separate positive charges. Uh, that's usually quite, uh, quite rare. Uh, of course, we know that nature doesn't like charges. Even having one positive charge usually makes a molecule quite unstable and hard to make. It's quite rare to find a molecule with two separate positive charges, especially right next to each other like this. We might be surprised that it's even possible to make this molecule, but now we shouldn't be surprised. Usually, it's difficult to make a dication, but this dication is more, much more stable than you would have expected because it's aromatic. So it's the very fact that this is an aromatic compound that helps us to form a dication. Uh, so by the way, the same principle would hold for dianions. It's also possible to form dianions, especially if that allows the molecule to be aromatic. Uh, I think that I won't give you uh, any examples of that just to save time, um, but it should be apparent to you that we can use the same techniques for, uh, for dianions that we just used for this dication. What category does this molecule fall into? Aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? Well, we can try counting the pi electrons. There's two pi electrons in each pi bond. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten pi electrons. Which would normally indicate that this was an aromatic compound. However, there is a complication with this molecule. The complication is that this molecule is not flat. This molecule is not flat. So it's actually non-aromatic. Any molecule that's not flat is non-aromatic, regardless of how many pi electrons it has. Now, I've mentioned that usually probably most instructors would not expect you to try to figure out uh, when a molecule is not flat, because in many cases you can't tell just, for, uh, just by looking at it. Um, and so for the most part, for most practice problems, you're probably expected to assume that the molecule is flat. However, there's a couple of interesting special cases that oftentimes come up in OCHEM courses um, where the instructor might expect you to know that the molecule is not flat. Um, so you simply have to pay attention to what your uh, instructor covers in lectures so that you know um, which molecules you're responsible for knowing are not flat. But this is one of those molecules that there's a chance that your instructor might expect you to know. 
um, because there's a kind of an interesting reason why this molecule is not flat. Um, what's the big problem with this molecule being flat? Well, the big problem is the two hydrogens on these two carbons. Let's draw those hidden hydrogens in. So because each of these carbons is trigonal planar, uh, we can see that uh, what the geometry is going to be, this hydrogen must be pointing straight up vertically, and this hydrogen is pointing straight down vertically from this carbon. And you can start to see that there's going to be a major steric hindrance problem. Both of these hydrogens are pointing right at each other, so they're going to be trying to occupy the same region of space. Uh, you've probably heard that described as steric hindrance. Steric hindrance is basically a fancy word, uh, a fancy phrase for things getting you things getting in each other's way. So these two hydrogens are likely to start getting in each other's way. Well, steric hindrance um, makes the molecule much less stable. Now, these are actually only going to be in each, other, each other's way if the molecule is flat. So if we try to draw everything in the plane of the blackboard, then you can see how these two hydrogens would end up getting in each other's way. On the other hand, if the molecule can bend and not be flat, um, then it wouldn't be necessary for these hydrogens to be pointing right at each other. So now we can understand why this molecule prefers not to be flat. If it is flat, the hydrogens end up getting in each other's way. But if the molecule is not flat, um, then there's less steric hindrance for those hydrogens. That explains why the molecule prefers not to be flat and therefore would end up being non-aromatic. Something I haven't mentioned before is that sometimes actually a molecule has a choice as to whether it's going to be flat or not. Uh, the molecule can bend itself so that it will either be flat or non-flat. So which is the molecule going to prefer? Well, it's going to bend itself in such a way as to get um, the most stable structure. If the most stable structure is flat, then the molecule would tend to bond that way. And if it's non-flat, the molecule would tend um, to, bond to, uh, to, to bend so that it's uh, not going to be flat. Um, so, for example, if a molecule has a choice between being anti-aromatic and being non-aromatic, um, in many cases it's going to bend so that it will not be flat. That will allow it to be non-aromatic. Uh, it doesn't want to be anti-aromatic because that has very low stability. Now, not all molecules have that flexibility. Sometimes the molecule isn't flexible enough to stop being flat and then it's forced to be anti-aromatic. Um, but if the molecule has enough flexibility so that it can bend to form a non-flat structure, usually it would prefer that to being anti-aromatic. On the other hand, suppose the molecule has a choice between being aromatic and non-aromatic. Which would the molecule prefer? Would it prefer to be flat and aromatic or non-flat and non-aromatic? Well, obviously, aromatic is especially stable and especially good. So if the molecule has that choice, it's going to prefer to bend in such a way that the molecule is flat, that gives it that extra stability. Um, so, generally speaking, um, most of the time when you end up with a non-aromatic compound, it's because the molecule doesn't want to be flat, because being flat would force it into this anti-aromatic configuration. If you have enough flexibility to bend to be non-flat, the molecule would prefer to be non-aromatic versus anti-aromatic. On the other hand, when the molecule has a choice between being aromatic and non-aromatic, usually it would prefer to be aromatic. Now, I want to point that out just to show that this example kind of uh, contradicts that or goes against it. Remember that if this molecule were flat, it would be aromatic. With 10 pi electrons, the molecule would normally be aromatic if it's flat. Um, and that just goes to show you how much steric hindrance there is from having these two hydrogens in the same region of space. Um, so even though being flat would allow this molecule to be aromatic, it still prefers to be non-flat, <coughs> to be non-flat, so separate these two hydrogens. All right, so again, I wanted to give you this example because it's possible if you're in a rigorous OCHEM class that your instructor might expect you to know that this molecule is not flat. Um, but again, I'll repeat what I've said uh, a couple of times before. In most OCHEM classes, for most of the problems, the instructor probably just wants you to assume that the molecule is flat. So this is a somewhat uh, minor detail, um, only necessary for relatively harder problems. For most run-of-the-mill run problems, you're expected probably to assume that the molecule is flat.